Hi, everybody. This is James Chai, RFARF Park Park Rescue Foundation, and I am trying to do a broadcast, and unfortunately, it looks like my screen has gone blank. I, I have no idea what has happened here. Um, I hope everyone can bear with me. And I think I will probably... Oh, crud. Hey, Hedy. Um, I don't even have a screen on my thing right now for some odd reason. This Facebook stuff is really, uh, really bad. So I'm just going to try to wing it. Uh, I, I don't see a screen on my own thing at all but I can see comments. Um, all right, so I'm just going to get on to it, uh, and I apologize for running a little bit late. And some of you will see this. This is my new microphone. Uh, I just received my microphone, two of them, uh, a couple of boom arms and stuff like that just to start getting to podcasting. If the sound doesn't sound, uh, the sound quality is not that great, please let me know. It's going through my old computer. Uh, but soon and shortly, I'll start doing some better looking video as well. Uh, this will probably be one of my last live vlogs that I'll be doing on a consistent manner. I'll be recording them beforehand and then putting them up there. It'll be relatively raw, but the video quality is way better. And because I don't have my computer ready uh, and able to work with the, uh, with the new equipment because my Computer's old, and my new one's coming in at the uh, beginning of next month. So you're gonna have to bear with me. But I, like I said, I won't be doing a lot of uh, live vlogs by the looks of it here. Uh, but today I'm gonna talk about November 15, 2019, episode number 37: resource guarding, understanding what food actually means to a dog, as well as going beyond the generalized fear descriptions of dog behavior. So it's gonna be kind of somewhat a little bit shorter today uh, over the stuff that um, I'm talking about just because it's running late and, um, you know, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to also be answering a, a, a question of a um, another person, um, Annette, who asked as well. Uh, one of her questions, her question was in the in my closed reactive dog group is, how do you help a dog control their emotions? The more excited, anxious, the more, uh, and that's talking obviously about her dog, the more excited and anxious, the more he continues to work himself into a frenzy. A yapping frenzy. So we're going to go over that part, and um, also just going to talk about a few other things. And just let me just see here. So hi, Hetty. So I see Hetty there. Okay. So uh, yeah, I'm completely a black screen, so I have no idea what's going on. I'm just going to talk to myself. I think. Um, well, I can see myself on my little phone, but that's about it. All right. So. Um, you know, so later on, I'm going to talk about uh, dogs that have emotional issues and just going to generalize about that part. It's going to be really silly sounding because it's not going to be specific to what Annette's asking for, um, but it's just a general thing. And the other thing is, uh, for those of you who are following me, please, um, you know, I thank you so much. Um, please share my work. Please follow me on YouTube. And I'm almost to 500 uh, subscribers now. I'm at like 489, which is actually pretty cool considering a month and a half ago I was at like 220. And uh, it's not bad for an organic thing. And I'm very thankful for people who are following me and, and listening to what I'm saying. As well, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at arf, arf, bark, bark. So uh, let me just see here. Okay. So uh, you know what I want, I want to do is I want to revisit my a little bit of my vlog on Wednesday, my last uh, vlog uh, live broadcast on Wednesday regarding dysfunctional dogs at Resource Guard Food. Uh, and I talk about the fact that you shouldn't, well, that I, sh I, I don't encourage people to throw food or treats to their dogs who's dysfunctional, who have resource guarding issues, who are new to the home, and you're not really sure uh, what they're like to begin with as you sort of feel, feel out their, their energy, their rhythm, and the way they are going to uh, blend in with the rest of your family, whether or not you have dogs already or whichever. You're not really sure about the background of your dog. You're not really sure of the history, you know, if they come from a shelter or the rescue doesn't have really um, specific information, which happens quite often. It's really hard for rescues, and I'm a registered nonprofit, RFR Bark Bark Rescue Foundation, so I'm a registered nonprofit. So I know how hard it is trying to get background information from uh, from whoever surrendered their dog, or if the dog comes from a shelter, then pretty well 50% of it is unbelievable because a lot of times people who are surrendering their dog will find up any excuse to give up on the life of their dog and just abandon their dog, right? So it's a bit of a tough thing. But when you are getting a dog that you've adopted and you know that your dog 
that is coming to your home might have some dysfunctions. I talk about not throwing treats to your dog in the beginning, just so your dog can learn about the natural rhythm and the behaviors of what's going on. Other times people are a little bit afraid of getting nipped by their dog because the teeth are sharp. But, you know, if the dog is not an aggressive dog, just over anxious, hyperactive, happy, super happy dog is going to have a little bit of nippiness in the beginning because they they don't know. They're not sure how we, the humans, are going to react around them. And don't forget too, when a dog is grabbing onto something and we're just throwing a, we're bringing a treat to them, they gotta, they gotta be able to anticipate the size. They gotta be able to anticipate the size, the, the, the speed, our speed, what to touch. And if you think about it, how fast dogs are, the instant, you know, the ones that are really just in, in control of what's going on, the instant that the dog touches your fingers, they already know that they've reached something that's soft to a solid feeling. Just like we know when we bite on something, you know, you bite on a piece of popcorn and then you can feel the kernel. Well, we hope we can find it. And then there goes a couple of fillings. But most times uh, we're able to bite on something if we're aware of it and we're able to pull back and not crunch and break our teeth on it. And so that's what our dogs are doing. And they're doing it at a tenth of a second. So they're brilliantly fast. One of the things that uh, I, I don't do, like I said, is I don't throw treats to my dogs uh, that are dysfunctional. It just encourages them to be nippy because they don't know what's going to come out of our, my hand. They don't know when I'm going to throw it because you know how we always don't throw it at the same rhythm. Sometimes we want to trick our dogs and tease them or whatever and be, be silly like that. Our dog is anticipating that movement. They're watching our physical action in a dog that is resource guarding or nippy. When we're throwing it, we're just teaching that dog to start snapping. And not in a bad way, but we just teach them, well, we're just going to start throwing the stuff. So you might as well just get ready to catch it out of midair. That's kind of like ninja speed. And what we're doing to our dog who is dysfunctional, we're saying to them, it's okay to be snappy. And you'll see that a lot of times people who have adopted dogs and you see the videos and you see the people throwing, you know, in their kitchen and they're taking like a piece of cheese off the cutting board and they're throwing it to their dog. They're handing it to their own dogs that they've known for a long time. And then they're throwing it to the newly adopted dogs that have some potential issues. And you can see the dogs are starting to nip and jump in the air, anticipatory behavior as they jump up towards the cheese being thrown at them. It causes them to be nippy so that when we're walking by these dogs, that are resource guarding and nippy, they are thinking at all times there might be food in our hand, especially when we have this kind of erratic behavior or we're walking quickly or we look like we've grabbed something off the counter and our dog thinks, oh, good, there's something there. Yeah, all right on, we're going to have it. And, and I talk about it in my last vlog. So just want to say, again, try to avoid throwing treats um, to your dog unless you have an established trust with them and you know what's going on then you have an idea what's going on and then you'll be like oh that's kind of cool i can throw the treats to, the, to my dog you do it beforehand you're just going to teach them to be nippy and on top of that you also want to be cautious about giving uh treats to your dog um, and maintaining a consistency on how to give those treats to your dog. So basically follow the same pattern every time, the same routine every time of giving the treat to your dog in a slow, patient, measured way. When I have a treat, I will, uh, you know, I will, you know, like say, for example, this dental floss thing is a treat, and I will make sure that I show it to my dogs, all of them, with my open palm, open hand, so they can see that I have nothing else. So my dogs can count visually in an abstract format, they can count that there's only one item there. And then they understand that when I throw it to them, that I throw it to them, and after I throw it to them, then I show them the open hand. And there's a way to do that, especially with aggressive and predatorial dogs. It's a much more different way to do so. Um, but in the beginning, you get your new dog, just play nice with them. Remember, it's great to hand feed them, but you want to make sure that you give a certain routine every time so that your new dog can rely on your regularity, your habit. They're going to watch you. They're not being habituated to you. They're being accustomed, right? They're watching your behavior. And they're always. that's why if you kind of sometimes move a little bit too quick, they start to, to snap or go towards that direction of the food. So just make sure that when you have a new dog that you're just hand feeding them. And when you have other people do it, hand feed them. And if you have children or people who are somewhat skittish themselves or really quick movement, you want to avoid uh, getting them to give treats in the beginning. Just let your dog understand an established pattern amongst the adults, excuse me, because your dog knows 
can tell who's an adult, who's a child. So just make an established pattern and then teach or train your children or your friends, family, uh, in-laws, the same method so that your dog learns the consistency. And those of you who have watched my vlogs know about the psychology of buying the proper leash. I talk about consistency and that consistency is so important in the beginning because that's how we build trust. It's just like going out with somebody and you fall in love. You're only falling in love with that person because you trust her or him. They've shown you reliability. They can be trusted. They're not making up stories. You know, I'm on online dating all the time and it's never truthful people sometimes. Well, not never. There are truthful people, but there are more scammers out there and uh, idiotic people who are just mudding it up for the good people out here. Okay. The other thing to keep in mind is what I didn't get a chance to say about the vlog was hand feeding a, a, a dog that does resource guard. It does not guarantee that it will make your dog that's resource guarding friendly to other people that are feeding treats. So again, you want to make sure that you have a consistency, a certain consistency of method of teaching your dog, how you're giving them the treat. And that way you can teach strangers, family, friends, children, in-laws, parents, how to properly give a treat in the same format that you give them. Otherwise, if you're just giving them uh, hand feeding out of your bowl to uh, out of their food bowl to them, what's going to happen is they're just going to be used to you and they're going to be relying on you and they'll be okay and they'll be dependent on you and your behavior. And then they get somebody else who's feeding them in the beginning, the dogs, the, the dysfunctional dog be like, Oh, okay, that's all right. And then they start noticing differences in behavioral patterns of the human the new human or the different human and then they start looking at it in a different way a little bit suspicious because it's not consistent because they're not used to being hand fed or by another stranger another human if they come from an abuse situation uh, those dogs are going to be quite cautious of humans right you see uh, the the term uh, hand shy right when the dog's like that and all right it, it's not necessarily hand shy it's just that dog is aware of what has happened from the hands and I don't want to say it hand shy because when we say hand shy about a dog, then we start to devalue their psychological uh, trauma. A dog's hand shy. Well, okay, well, yeah, it's a general term like fear, right? But why are they hand shy? Okay, from abuse. Well, then the answer is the dog's not hand shy. The dog is afraid of being beaten. And when you know the difference of dog is hand shy, or the dog is afraid of being beaten, you know that you're gonna be much more sympathetic, compassionate, patient with a dog that's been beaten versus oh, dog's hand shy. Well, what a, the dog just doesn't trust me. And then people take a personal front. So you wanna be careful on not personalizing, you wanna be careful about hand feeding dogs so that's consistent and be aware that it does not automatically make a highly dysfunctional dog, especially a highly dysfunctional or resource guarding dog, normal or, or, or median or part of the rest of the other type of happy dogs. You want to set your dog up to succeed. You want to set yourself up to succeed by going step by step and don't push things. Please do not push things. When I talk about Walter coming here, uh, the Great Dane, 180 plus pounds. He was beaten partially blind, 20% partially blind, 10% hearing loss, slight brain damage, beaten by six out of seven different homes, attacked 16 people in New York, three kill orders, an active one from the court of New York. He's never allowed to step foot in, in, in it again. All these significant situations, I always set from the point of being patient. And I will have said to the Southampton Animal Shelter and their volunteers at that time, it would take anywhere from seven to 12 to 14 months. And when I found out that Walter had much more significant issues uh, and, and the blindness uh, and, and hearing impairment, I revised it from seven to 12, 14 months to 12 to 19 months, which was essentially double his whole, whole entire lifespan. So I went from thinking myself, hoping that I have him stabilized in 14 months across the spectrum, then it was gonna be 19 months. And uh, when I talk about across the spectrum, I mean like, you know, being able to be out in public, uh, running around and all that stuff, which is just nothing. That's a nothing burger. That's, you know, him being dog reactive in the beginning, working him down, training. That's nothing. It's easy to do. Male reactive. It's easy to deal with. It's him being in a place where he is in a guarded or a uh, anticipatory or a heightened position of such as waiting for food. 
And those are dangerous situations. Being out in public, being off leash, you know, people know about the dogs. Oh, when my dog's on leash, he's reactive. When he's off leash, he's happy as crazy. Absolutely for sure. With the more predatorial dogs, the highly dysfunctional dogs, their behavior is completely different. Their issues are submerged, and those are the issues that are more dangerous. Those are the ones that you don't see. Those are the ones that people say are unpredictable when in actual fact it's not unpredictable. It's just we're too slow as humans to pay attention to it. So um, the, the other thing, too, is to remember that dogs um, need to be taught and shown and shared that uh, us humans, that we as their parents, we're giving them food. And that food has to be given to them as a, an aspect of safety and contentment and security and love and sharing. Because as I said last vlog, food does not exist anywhere in the entire canine species as a communication tool. It's not a reward feed. It's not used in any way whatsoever. It's humans, the scientists that you're paying three, $400 uh, an hour or two to come visit your home and start throwing food at them. It's a human conjecture. Oh, well, the dog's going to comply to food because that's his motivation. That should work on everything, including the dangerous dogs. Oh, wait a minute. The dangerous dog won't take the food because the dangerous dog just wants to be dangerous. Oh, well, then the dangerous dog needs to be killed. And that's when I talk about those submerged dysfunctions, the psychological aspects that are below the surface, and they are Mount Everest underneath the surface, and they're significant. But they can all be dealt with. We just have to teach our dogs to understand that what we're doing with them is that we're sharing with them our safety, our contentment, our security, our love with our dog to be able to get through with them. I, in the beginning, when I would give Walter food, and I've talked about this beforehand, even when I came close to him, he would snap at me to get food thinking the treat was there, right? Because people would throw it at him, you know, that part also because he didn't trust men, especially because every man beat him in his life. Um, so he would not be very, very cautious. And, he, you know, when the dog has her head up like this, they can, they're like a cobra. They can snap forward. Uh, and then Walter's six feet, four inches on standing uh, on hind legs, 38 inches at the withers, 180 plus pounds. So when he went forward, he went forward about 14 inches. It's really like a cobra. You're like, holy crud. And he moves so lightning fast. You're just like, wow, unbelievable. So that's one thing to keep in caution is how fast um, the dogs will move when it comes to treats, right? The snappiness and all that stuff. So just kind of keep an eye out for that because dogs are watching us for our physical behavior at all times. Absolutely 100%, right? They're predators to begin with. We're predators. We're always watching things. So um, anyhow, I'm, I'm going to go on to the next part here. One of, in regards to what Anna, uh, Annette Miller uh, asked uh, a couple of days ago in my closed uh, reactive dog group, actually anyone is welcome to join it. Just go to arfarfbarkbark.com, check out the tab that says help for your dogs and you'll see screenshots of descriptions and photos of dogs and how I've accurately uh, with 100% proficiency uh, read their, your these people's dogs and the issues and how to address the base issues on it uh, which are the dysfunctions these are the issues that lead dogs into death um, okay so Annette asks uh, how do you help a dog control their emotions the more excited anxious the more he continues to work himself into a yapping frenzy right and, and I and I wrote read that earlier and then the other thing is it's getting past the point of what and why our dog is reacting. What is the reason for, right? It's fear. It's, it's such a general term. Fear is, is an emotion. Fear is what drives all of us humans to survive and to succeed. Fear of death, fear of the unknown, fear, fear of failure, uh, fear, of, fear of incompetency, um, lots of stuff, right? It's all this fear. We, we have doubt. We, we're insecure. We're codependent. We're not predators as per se, but we can be predators. But we are all driven by fear. Animals are as well. Dogs fear. They react. They're consequential to the environment. It's fear. So um, the important part is understanding the definition of that fear. Just like yesterday when uh, Tova was asking about Riley in regards to her pug, and uh, I talked about going beyond the description, whereas it's not just the fact that she's reactive to other dogs and least reactive and, and the worst kind of dog anyone's ever seen before. She's not. She's median. 
and I talked to Tova, uh, her her mom today about it on the phone. Um, it, it's it's not. She's got low self esteem, right? She's overwhelmed, a whole bunch of things, right? And uh, we'll be meeting up with Tova and her partner to to work a session with her. Um, so, oops, I banged on there. I'm sorry, guys. You probably heard that. So. Uh, uh, there was a post that was in one of the groups, and it wasn't a dog training group, um, but it was a regular dog owners group, and they were asking questions about their dog that was reactive, and their dog was on leash and lunging at people and other dogs, I think it is, and they didn't know why. And, you know, the usual stories come out. Uh, people comment, you know, science-based academia and the, the this all this other kind of silly stuff and positive art training. And I, I don't even know what any of these co- these made up words are they're all so silly they're all so immature it's just so unsophisticated and and i'm like okay uh you guys are talking about something on a science that has no 100 percent success rate on it it's got a 60 percent success rate so i was kind of like okay well i'm going to respond back to it so this is what i wrote down for y'all um so you can hear it and uh, I'm going to read it through you. So we must address our dog's emotions by understanding what it is they want. Usually it is an acknowledgement of their existence and relevance to us. Just like children, right? Our child wants our attention, wants our attention. They're playing by themselves and they come up and go, mom, 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 dad, dad, dad. They want our attention, right? They want to be acknowledged. They feel lonely. They feel codependent and they want our attention. So uh, with dogs, they're overt in their codependency. When we are covert in our codependency, we tend to hide our need for help, need for affection, need for love with other people, unless we're with people that we trust. Ours is covert. We're not openly giving hugs to our coworkers and our bosses, regardless if it was a politically incorrect or correct aspect of it, but we're not going out giving people random hugs for no reason. And so uh, that's because we're covert. If we know the people, we'll be happy to get a attention and a hug. I mean, I'm I'm a kind of person who doesn't like to give hugs unless I know the person because it's to me an intimate. Uh, it's an emotional. It's an intimate thing, right? It's it's a bond, and I don't want to just give it away freely to every you know Sally and Joe out there. So uh, dogs, on the other hand, are overt codependent, and they're happy to jump up and down and roll on their back ends and be super happy for attention. But we also have to understand why. And it's from the codependency that they have, the need to be with us and to enjoy and to share and to express their true love for and with us. There's a saying that says, uh, and it's you know attributed to a whole bunch of different people. And they have memes of it with Keanu Reeves and other things where it says, uh, the dog is the only creature on earth that loves you more than he loves himself. And I say that's total garbage. It's, it's, it, it's so dumb of a statement. It's impossible for any creature, any human being to love another person or another creature more than they love themselves. It's impossible to love more than 100%. If you love more than 100%, then it's an infatuation. So it's impossible to have a dog that loves you more than they love themselves. The dog loves you. Our dogs love you as much as they love themselves. They're willing to give up their life to defend us. They're willing to give up their life to defend their family, their pack. That's codependency. That's love. That's 100%. That's true love. That's the, uh, that's the husband saying, I'm going to give my, you know, one of my kidneys to, to my wife. That's true love. That's the expression of it. And that's what your dog is doing. So um, it's where the codependency comes from. If you put it into that scale and you look at the exuberance of behavior your dog has, it will make sense. And um, the other thing is your dog is always looking to you to parent them with the safety, with safety, right? You know, with food and all that stuff, they want to feel safe. And the reaction that they're going to have is going to be based out of threat out of fear of a out of feeling like they're going to be attacked out of fear that you're going to their humans going to be attacked out of fear that they're unsafe in their territory they're exposed that's the dysfunctional dog and when that happens to the dysfunctional dog they start finding reasons to be defensive by being offensive because they're acting consequential to their environment 
and, and so in my reply to this post, it was about an owner who was um, uh, being taught to use food as a training device on a reactive dog. And, um, you know, people were telling him, uh, telling her this and that. And I was just like, wow, this is so silly. Um, and it's so silly because they're, they're saying, well, you know, she, the, the, the owner was saying, you know, my dog's fair reactive. And the people are saying, my, your dog's fair reactive. And he was going, they were going to some guy named Ray Underwood. He's, I've heard of him. Yeah. You know, yeah. Anyways, um, you know, I'd like to see him work with some of my dogs, any of my dogs. Um, not trying to be a challenge on it, but just sometimes when you're sending out the wrong information, uh, it shows the uh, the um, inexperience. And when you're asking people to pay for multiple sessions and you're still not getting anywhere and you're talking about advancement, you're like, oh, and my dog is graduating to the next level and the next certificate level. I'm like, wow, you just bought your kid a karate black belt, didn't you? for your dog instead. Uh, it's such a commercialization. And this industry, which is uh, uh, almost seven zero, seventy $70 billion industry, they're not going to cut their own throats. They're not going to cut away their source of income. The more dogs that go through the system, the more dogs that are trained, the more income and revenue continues at the expense of dogs being killed. And that's me, right? You know, I have people who have asking me to do multiple sessions and I'm like, no, you only need one session and then we'll revisit in a couple of weeks. Not trying to be a jerk to people, but it's, you can do it. You, you guys can do it on your own. You did it on your own already. And I'm happy to help encourage people to do so. But I also want to, and I'm a big believer in helping to fortify and build the foundation from within with the tools that are provided to you. And then you become a smarter, more uh, connected person to your dog. Uh, women are much more intuitive than men because of the emotional context and the sophistication that women have with emotions. So uh, you'll see always great growth, but then we we want to also make sure that, oh, I want to make sure that that people are trusting themselves, that they have time to trust themselves so that they can start developing it. Because after you know five or six sessions, um, people should have a pretty amazing proficiency with their dog's ability and their dog's behavior should be reduced by upwards of 60, maybe even 70% on their own. Uh, when I work with people's dogs, I usually get a, a 60 to 80, sometimes 100% um, uh, progress on it. But I know that it's not just a one day thing. It's got to be on and on and on and on. And um, yeah, so anyhow, okay. So um uh, so what I wrote down is uh, when it comes to evaluation and addressing dogs with quote unquote fear behavior, it's extremely important to understand that the sophistication of dogs is and must be understood beyond the generalization of fear. There are root dysfunctions relational to cognitive and emotional processing. It's understanding the psychogenetic indicators and the psychogenetic indicators are the root issues, the root psychological issues, the reason for the psychosis in the dog. What's the dysfunction? It's the psychosis. What are the root of it? The psychogenetic root. What's the psychogenetic root of the dog's behavior that causes him to act fearful? Well, is he insecure? Is he afraid of being attacked? Like Riley, low self-esteem. It's going beyond just the fear label. It's being specific. And it's doable because people who know their dogs that well will tell me what they already know. And it's like, there you go. You got it already. It's your intuition. And then we just craft it forward from them. Um, yeah, so it's understanding the psychogenetic indicators, not just saying fear and other generalizations. And that's one thing you also want to make sure is when you're talking to your, um, to your trainer, your behaviors, wherever you are, you want to know more than just the fear generalizations. What kind of dysfunctions does my dog have? What kind of dependency issues does my dog have? Is it codependency? Is it intradependency? Is it interdependency and codependency? As I talked about, interdependency in regards to being able to 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 socialize uh, socialize with other dogs and humans, and intradependency is when the dog is only able to maintain a relationship healthy, which is not a healthy re <coughs> relationship with their human or their immediate family intra. And then I talk about modular. Uh, 
modular interdependency and ladder dependencies and so forth like that. But that's for another uh, part of it. Um, so uh, going on in my post, I write back, um, dogs exist in, in variants of dependencies. There we go. Okay. Along with a sentient understanding of self and your dogs do have a sense of self because if they don't have a sense of self, then they wouldn't have jealousy and they wouldn't crowd in when you're petting another dog, they wouldn't crowd in between you and the other dog. That's a sense of self. It's a complex emotion to have jealousy. Jealousy is, is, is not just premeditated. It, it's it, like, it's not even a premeditated thing. It's a reaction aspect and it's to do with loss and possession. And I talk about it in another, uh, in, a, in a, one of my earlier vlogs about the complexity of jealousy and the ability for our dogs to be able to process that at such a rudimentary format is absolutely astounding. And we're not recognizing that. And from that desire of jealousy is the dog's sense of self. And we're not talking about uh, Freud and we're not talking about uh, 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 id and, and, and super ego or super id or whatever it is. We're not talking about that kind of stuff. We're just talking about the basic part that your dog knows who they are. And I talk about seniority in the home. I talk about your dog being recognized seniority wise in the home. They have a sense of when they arrived in the home. They have a sense of who arrived before or after them in the home. So it's that sense of self. It's that sense of codependency. Everything I talk about with dogs has to do with their emotional relationship, the cohabitation, the cross-species cohabitation, the emotional isomorphism. And I talk about these concepts which are not being spoken of anywhere. You talk to the dog training industry, people in the, they're like, what? That doesn't make sense. No, that doesn't make sense. And you're like, dude, then why is my dog acting this way? Oh, well, your dog's having behavioral issues. You, you should put your dog on medication. Oh, really? Medication for psychological issues? Wow. So if my dog is going on medication for psychological issues like Prozac or whatever, then what's the psychological issue that it's addressing? Fear? Oh, okay. Well, what kind of fear is it? Do you see what I mean? The scientists, the academia are just, just scratching. Temple Grandin, Ian Dunbar, Karen Pryor, they're, they're just scratching the surface. They don't know what they're doing because they're still looking at dogs as dumb animals. They come up with dumb terms like behavioral euthanasia, which is a ridiculously disgusting scapegoat, gutless way of killing dogs under that title. Uh, because it's not behavioral euthanasia. It's not any of these things. Your dog is afraid of something. Find out what it is. Demand more of your trainer and your behaviors. Demand more. What is the reason for the fear? What is the reason for the quote-unquote label of behavioral euthanasia? Get out of the scapegoating, scapegoating of your dog because your trainer and behavior doesn't know what's going on. Ask them to describe the dependency issues in detail. Every single dog that I've worked with, and I only, I, I well, I, I work with all. I work with mild issues, little OCD issues, digging, licking paws, that kind of stuff, mild issues. They're all psychosomatic. They all have to deal with a psychological issue, right? Because the dog's not going to start licking their paws because they're, they've, been, uh, they've got a broken leg. They're going to start licking their paws because they have a dysfunction, anxiety, whatever the issues are, depending on the dog's psychological profile. So being able to work with Walter, with Nero, with, uh, with Minky, right? Minky, over 20,000 plus dogs from the meat dog uh, uh, trade in, in China, Korea, all that. Out of 20,000 plus dogs, Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation could not get a single step inward with Minky in four months. And they have a well-known behaviorist on their board of uh, uh, board of directors, they know Caesar Milan, they know all the people, Matt Damon, they have all that stuff. They couldn't figure it out. Minky came here within seven to uh, eight days in my videos, the four videos that you've seen, uh, able to address the issues. And he hates men, especially Asian men coming from Korea, uh, meat dog farm, um, and been bitten people and became a bit of a public uh, liability that I you know, I, I agreed to help Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation in exchange for them sharing my work, which they haven't done. But um, when it comes to dealing with Minky, with Walter, the dangerous dogs, everything I'm talking about, everything I'm telling you guys about codependency and all that stuff works 100%. And it worked 100% with the most dangerous, extremely dangerous, predatorial, vicious dogs that 
are around and they're significant in size, which means that obviously my theories are theorems now because they're not just theories. They've been proven into theorems by direct work with these guys. They work and they've been able to work with every single other dog that I've ever met, depending on skittishness or uh, OCD, all of them. Dogs spinning around in the circles, that's an OCD trait. Dogs wrapping around behind you and wrapping themselves around you. It's an anxiety-driven issue, right, Sally? Like uh, with uh, with Sally, right, Hetty? <laughs> that, yeah, thanks, Kim. Oh, I look, I'm looking at the stuff now. Casey. Hey, Casey. Um, Sean, Michael. Oh, uh, Mike, uh, Kim. Yeah, I got the microphone. Um, Daniel, do you know, do you believe food reward is okay for non-reactive dogs? Yeah, food is great as a snack. Get food anytime you want. Here you, here's your, to your dog. Here's some food. There you go. You're rewarding them. You're not. No, you're just giving them something to eat and you're sharing joy. And talk about this last night. Uh, sorry, on, on my Wednesday vlog. You're, you're sharing with your dog this joy, right? What happens? You give your dog a, a, a snack for no reason. Your dog's like, woohoo, this is awesome. Whereas if you give your dog for, you know, you can give your dog treats for obedience and training and all that stuff because that um, expedites compliance. But when it comes to dysfunctions, definitely not for a reactive dog because you also set the wrong message. You set a really difficult message to your dog. And that is, I'm not letting you process the environment. I'm distracting you from processing the environment. So that way you don't learn about the environment. You only learn about food. And then when you can no longer process that experience because you no longer are able to control your anxiety and your anxiousness and your reactivity and your aggressiveness and food's no longer working, you've gone past the red line. And for the majority of trainers' behaviors, it's just beyond them. I would say, well, I, I get about 70% of the people end up killing their dogs when they contact me because they're like, well, you know, over the phone and all stuff, uh, video consults, because they're like, they're just not willing to try anymore. And they're just looking for this desperate hope that I'm going to take their dog or I have some magical pill, which I don't, especially since I, I cross the way. People don't want to make the effort either. People don't want to take responsibility and take the time to address the issues that they themselves uh, often caused by not recognizing the reactivity and they come to a desperate point in their position because friends and family and people are telling them to kill their dog and they are getting to the point where they themselves are like, oh, okay, I'm done. And then they emotionally disenfranchise and then their dog starts to suffer and then they start to get possessive or some sort of uh, righteousness or, or, or sense of privilege. And then they refuse to, surrender their dog and they go, well, I'm just going to kill my dog instead. And it's like, wow, just, you have no idea. Like in the world that I, I live in and Sean, you know, this, the world that I live in, it's always doom. I don't get people going, Hey, you know what? I want to phone you. I'm phoning you up just to say, hi, how's it going, James? Let's go out for coffee. I want, you know, my dog's great. I just thought you're doing a great job, James. I want to take you out for coffee and all that. I don't get that. I get the James we are desperate for help. We have tried four different trainers, spent $2,000, and we have gotten nowhere with our dog. And our trainer is now telling us that our dog's the worst they've ever seen. And we should consider either strong medication or killing our dog. That's where the world I live in, right? So it's that's why when I read these things about fear and the generalizations, like, no wonder you're frustrated because you're told your dog's got fear. And you're like, well, what kind of fear? What's going on? Your child, if you have a child that has a nightmare, you're going to ask your child while they're crying and freaking out that, they're, you know, like they're saying, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to die. And you're like, well, why are you afraid you're going to die? Because the world's going to end. What do you mean the world's going to end? I heard in school today that uh, the world is eventually going to end. Uh, you know how long that's going to take, honey? And, and in a million years? Yeah, probably a billion, 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 billion years from now, you'll you'll be dead. Well, I'm not gonna tell the kid you, you you won't have to worry about this ever happening. And then your kid's like, but that how long is a billion, billion, billion? You know, right? I mean, you work it all the way down and you destructure destructure the issue with your dog, and that's what ends up happening. Is I destructure what's going on with your dog and let you know what's going on. 
trainers and behaviors can do that. There's things such as intermediate bridging, terminal bridging, all these things. I have no idea what half of those things mean. I don't even care other than if I have to answer a question that somebody asked me about it, but I really don't know. I don't know what the positive R plus plus stuff is. None of it makes sense. And I have no reason to listen to it because none of it is successful. And I'll explain that why, because Nowhere in the entire canine species, as I've said before, is food used as a communication device, right? Much less a reward fiat. It's not used as a reward fiat. I have idiots that kind of, you know, mock me and troll me. Oh, what's a reward fiat? It's like, okay, whatever. I'm just going to, if you're that dumb, you're that, if you want to be that silly, go ahead. So, you know, food, in fact, is is a highly regarded object that wolves, dogs, lions will fight to the death over. And what we're doing is we're using food as an anthropomorphic device. Our conjecture that, oh, well, since the dog is taking food and do sit and roll over and all that stuff, then we should be able to train the dog not to be fearful. Do you see the logic? Doesn't make sense. Your dog is fearful. We're going to give your dog food so he's not fearful. Hmm. You have a dysfunction. How do you address your dysfunction? You go through counseling. You go through it for those of you who can self, self-regulate. self You go through it yourself and you break down and you get out of your pity party. Dogs don't have the ability to do so. But the last thing the dog wants is for you to give them food because, oh, you're afraid? Here's some food. You're afraid? Here's some food. You want to kill the other dog? Here's some food. It works on the minor dogs, minor issues with the dogs, V3, maybe V4 level maybe V4, which is bite level four in the APDT scale, Dr. Ian Dunbar's silly scale. It doesn't work with dogs at a five or six, and it doesn't work with the dogs that I work with ever. Those people who want to do that with a dog like that are those people who then say that dog's got to be killed because I don't know what to do with the dog and he tried attacking me. Well, duh, <laughs> you know, you're giving them food and you, what? You know, I, there's some of you might know a guy named Kyle Schwab down in LA. This guy, I saw him do a video where he actually wants to feed a reactive dog. He takes a treat and he puts it on his elbow and he squats down and he feeds a reactive dog that way. And he goes, this is the best way to feed a dog to trust you. No, idiot. That's the best way for a dog to bite you in the face. He's got the, like, the treats right here, and he's and then the dog's not even reactive. It's just a regular kind of like hyperactive, somewhat dog. He's not reactive. He's not a f- scary dog. He's nothing. I mean, the, the dogs that I work with, Kyle would literally be mortally wounded. But I see the video, and I and I brought him to task about it, and he starts making all these little things and calls me thinks I'm gay for him and all that stuff. He actually says, "I'm like, wow, dude, you you bring in every card you can," but he's trying to feed dogs with a treat on his elbow. Because he thinks feeding food, because the dog complies to treats for obedience and trick training, that the dog's going to take the food because it addresses the dog's fear. It won't address fear with a human being. It won't address fear with your dog because your dog's not that dumb. But it's human arrogance that happens to it. Giving food to address a dog's behavior dysfunctions is literally passive-aggressive Pavlov. Ivan Pavlov, right, the Russian? Ivan Pavlov published his theory in 1897, 122 years ago, when women couldn't vote and men owned or people owned slaves. 1897. And we're still stuck on that because then it became operant conditioning with B.F. Skinner. And I have some notes and some reference uh, links in, in, in my thing that I'll update after I go through all this. B.F. Skinner, operant conditioning. And the worst part is, when you talk to any trainer or behavior that goes operant conditioning and the four quadrants of, uh, of that and all that stuff, it's like, hello, do you not understand that B.F. Skinner has been debunked and he's been proven in dumb? Okay, so we're, we're going to get to this in a little bit. I'm just gonna, I was like, holy cow. Like, I, I read his uh, uh, Beyond Freedom and uh, Beyond Dignity and Freedom. I got to like page 27, 28, and it's a very com- complicated words i had to look up lots of dictionary lots of dictionary referencing like okay what is that word what is that word and then afterwards i'm like he's just talking in circles like it's it's super complicated but when you start looking at it he's just talking in circles he's seeing the same theory over and over again behaviorism and blah 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 it's like dude 
it's not going to work. And so I didn't know any of this. And then I started doing this research on it afterwards because I was responding back to this post. Um, so I went on further on this post and I say, be cautious of the misnomer of quote unquote science-based academia, close quote. This application is successful at less than 60% of dysfunctional dogs. So what I'm saying in that, that quote is that it doesn't matter your science-based academia. It doesn't matter if you are Dr. Rebecca Ledger or you're uh, Temple Grandin. The theories and the behaviorisms and your opinions are only successful 60% of the time. Because if academia and Dr. Ledger and the SPCA and Dr. Dunbar and all these silly people knew what they were doing, they would have a 100% success rate. They wouldn't have such terms as behavioral euthanasia. They wouldn't have 6 million dogs dying annually. They wouldn't be able to say, I've never had to put a dog down for behavioral euthanasia. They'll never have to have said that if they were 100% successful because the science is not science-based. It's false-based. It's a false positive that has a 60% success rate. My work and anyone that knows me, Sean, you know, Hetty with Sally, right? It's Sally, uh, Hetty with Sally, right? She's not digging into the ground, right? You, I, I pointed out to you that those are OCD traits, behaviors and anxiety driven behavior for Sally. And we corrected that so that when we came back from the dog park with you and, and your husband, Sally wasn't digging into the ground anymore. She didn't need to. She felt safer, right? These anxiety driven aspects. But uh, when it comes to the aspects like uh, Dr. Ledger, Dr. Richter, Claudia Richter as well, um, all these silly, unsophisticated comments, uneducated comments, it's so crazy got a 60% success rate, but they're charging $400 an hour and saying they know what they're talking about. Dude, ain't got that because you're failing 40% of those dogs. And those are the 6 million dogs that are being killed. There's 100 million dogs, almost 199.4 million dogs in 2018 in North America, about 9.2, 9.4 million in Canada, and uh, 89, 90 million in the United States. In 2018, there's actually more cats domesticated than there are dogs. Just so you know, it's usually about 1% to 2% more cats. So the cats are always winning. Cats are always winning. The dogs are always in the doghouse with the cats. But the work that I've done works through across the board. Anyone. I'll take any dog. I'll work with any dog. You can set up an appointment, a schedule. It doesn't matter if they're mild. It doesn't matter if they're extremely predatorial. I've never turned down a dog. And it's because my work is based on science, based on the psychological aspects, based on the bridging of the psychosis between human and animal, being human and dog in regards to the behaviorisms, as well as the cohab, not behaviorism, as, as the behavior in regards to the cohabitative uh, uh, history of what's going on between humans and animals, uh, humans and dogs through evolution, et cetera. Um, I got to, I'm running out of time. Ooh. So, yeah, so the application is only successful at less than 60% of dysfunctional dogs. Talk to any trainer behaviors that deals with aggressive dogs. Ask them how many dogs have they had to kill, have they said is that way, or have they recommended medication. If you got more than zero on any of those three, then you know their science-based academia is failing at 40% uh, of the dogs are being killed, if not more. Right, so they have a minimal success rate at, with dogs that are at a bite level five, which is my vid level five as well. The APDT, Dr. Ian Dunbar's bite level five, they have a minimal success rate. And then when it comes to the bite level six dogs, my V level six dogs, and that's according to Ian Dunbar, where the dog has killed somebody or an animal, they have a 0% success rate. 0% across the board. Doesn't matter if it's Dunbar, doesn't matter if it's Pryor, Karen Pryor, uh, Dr. Ledger, it's 0% success rate across the board. The dogs I work with, 6, V6, V7 level, V8, V9, V10 level, right out to the top where they're predatorial, they are thinking, they stalk, they watch you, they strategize, they're significant in size, they have an established bite history, they have an established attack history, should I say, and their attacks are vicious, etc. I'm successful 100%. But what I do is what I teach other people to do. So what I do 
otherwise really difficult times alone with these dogs, I teach owners how to do it themselves. And they go on to do it themselves with patience, with simplicity of the work, with no medication, with no treats, with no choke collars, with just a regular collar and leash till they become more and more proficient. And then you go forward. And it's always about the family too. I always talk to people about the family, the husband, the wife, the wife, the husband, the boyfriend, girlfriend, the, the children, single person, the family. There is a family structure that goes on. And I work with the humans and the animals. When you're talking to the trainers and behaviors, you have to understand that they must be presenting a dynamic that works for you and your dog at the same time. I had one family whose dog, Maverick, um, the trainer, well-known trainer, actually, Sheila, Sheila Begg, was in an argument with her clients telling them to listen to her, even though what she was telling them to do wasn't working with their dog. And she was in an argument with them. And it's like, these people paid you, Sheila, uh, from Dizeen Pet Dog Training, which is really like pet dog training. Well, what other type of dog is there, right? What other type of pet dog is there? Um, uh, but, and I only do that because she backstabbed me anyways. I'm just being my big baby here. But um, the, you, when you hire me, you're asking me to help you with the most precious of your cargo. You're asking me to help you with a dog that people are telling you to kill. I'm honored already to, to be asked by that aspect. And I get people who are like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad to talk to you. And it's like, no, I'm actually more happy and more honored that you're asking me to work with something in your life that is precious, that means the difference between life and death, happiness and unhappiness. I have to work with you and your dog or dogs to understand what the dynamic is. On, on Sunday, I'm meeting up with a family that has four dogs and one of the dogs is attacking the other dogs and attacking more and more. So how do we deal with it? We deal with the, the structure of the family. Anyways, it's, it's really easy because you look at the placement, let's, just like managing a, a staff of four people, you understand the nuances of each behavior, how to create the uh, integration, the supervision, the consistency, and finding the pack rhythm, the family rhythm, just like musicality, you find the rhythm and you find it all in, like I say, I have five dogs here. All of them are reactive except for Sammy, who I said that Sammy doesn't like other dogs sometimes but they're all like that. They're all resource guarding. They're all the same way. And I, and I deal with them and it's integrated and I don't take, uh, I don't go, Oh, well, I'm going to take this dog instead. I'm like, you know what? Your dog's dangerous. I'll take him then just as long as he's significant in issues. Right. Um, okay. So, yeah. So I, so I talk about the 0% success rate with bite level six dogs. Minky, stop it, please. Uh, bite level six dogs. Um, and again, it's based on a Pavlov theory, 122 years old, right? And there's still 6 million dogs being killed, which means that obviously their science-based work is failing. It's failing. It's not working. 60% success rate. It's not even a 60% success rate. It's less than that. It's sad. Uh, 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 Daniel, when you asked me that question about food and all that stuff, right? Uh, one of the things I'd written down as well was using food when trying to downtrain a dysfunctional dog, right? That's a dog that growls, attacks, skittish, reactive, OCD. No matter how severe, giving, trying to use food, Daniel, is ineffective, right? So with a regular dog, it's no problem, but with a dysfunctional dog, it's ineffective by its sole purpose of forcing human conjecture onto a dog, which is forcing our human conjecture. Well, if the dog is going to take treats, right? Like talk about this at the top of my vlog. Dog's going to take treats and sit and roll over and all that stuff. Dog's going to be able to take treats when they're dysfunctional. Dog's going to take treats when they're angry. Dog's going to take treats when they're afraid. <laughs> it's like, really? Dog's going to take, oh, oh, okay, sure. Right? Um, you know, it's not going to work. Because we're forcing what we think is going to work. And if it doesn't work, then we Hulk smash it. And in the case of dogs, when we Hulk smash, we kill the dog. And we base that on the reference and the recommendations of the trainer and behaviors. And we especially base it on the recommendation of the well-known trainer and the highly regarded behaviors. I have worked with dogs that have gone to almost every single well-known trainer in Vancouver. Others that have gone to other places across the country, people who have spent over $10,000 traveling everywhere trying to get their dogs dealt with. I've worked with 
with, with dogs have gone to Ledger, Richter, Dr. Richter, Dr. Ledger, uh, I'm, other names, uh, people on the, the trainers up on the North Shore, uh, all these trainers. I've worked with all these dogs that these trainers have said, there's no way it can happen. And the owners contact me like, you know what? We don't think the trainer is able to do it. Like the dog dudes where they do alpha and they muzzle the dogs and they force the dog onto the ground. And that's basically abuse, right? That's physical abuse. That's archaic. That's what you did when you owned slaves 122 years ago. You beat people. Alpha is, is that same part. There's no need for, for such brutality unless it's absolutely warranted where the dog has attacked another dog or it's going to and you need to stop that or you're fearing for your life or whatever, but not just because you're angry. I mean, how dysfunctional can you be where you're taking out your anger because you don't know how to read a dog, you don't know how to control your dog, and you force your dog onto the ground, and you, you yell at him, and you rah, rah, rah. And the dog's like, I just was trying to be nice to you. Unless the dog's really reacting and you have to use force, that's the case. But I've never thrown any of my dogs on the ground. The, the Danes, the, the Minky, I've never thrown, I've never forced any of them on the ground ever, ever. doesn't matter. And they've come after me. And even when they're friendly and I can give them a hug like Walter, I can give Walter a full body hug. Even when he's a jerk, I've never forced him on the ground. I don't even make them sit. So it's just, it's just, it's just so silly when they talk about science-based because the science-based stuff that they're claiming about is just killing dogs. It's really, really quite sad. You know, on my end, Right. Okay. So, so the other thing that I wrote down in the post actually is uh, it's ineffective by its sole purpose, right? Which is the treat training and uh, dysfunctional dogs. It's forcing human conjecture right onto the dog without realizing that we humans have muddled up using food, which we were using for trick training and obedience training. We muddled that up by trying to use food to address dysfunctions, especially severe dysfunctions in dogs. And it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. We're giving the drug addict more drugs. We're telling our dog, I know you're angry. Here's some food. And you're like, why? Okay, so I'm going to keep pounding that in a little bit. But it, it doesn't help. It doesn't, right? it doesn't help your dog heal. Your dog feels undervalued, disrespected. I'm angry at this other person, uh, this other dog that's coming at me, and you're giving me food, but I'm still angry. Stop giving me food, right? I have other, uh, other aspects of that, but... um. You know, everything I've worked with has been with extremely dangerous dogs, extremely skittish dogs. You look at Gordon the Bulldog, disabled, reactive, 11 months of his life. Minky, 11 months of his life, and he could never have been picked up by anybody. And all the behaviorists and trainers and PhDs were saying there's no way that a dog like him could ever be picked up. It's an hour and 10 minutes it took me with no treats or medication. And then his foster, Andrea, learned to do it herself through what I taught her not magic it's really just intuition right and that's why i say women have a, a much better depth of uh, understanding you want to be cautious of operant conditioning right and and the various misconceptions that's been spread because bf skinner um, as I said earlier, he's been soundly debunked in regards to his theory. It's been disproven. It's been decried by the field. And there's a couple of links in my description in this post. Minky. 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 Hi, Minky. Hi, silly boy. Minky's over here now. Um, so I put a, a couple of links in, in, in the description, and I'll, and I'll clean it all up after I go through this uh, later on tonight. Um, one of the things that debunks B.F. Skinner, which is operant conditioning, right? Operant conditioning, the four quadrants, which is then relied upon by LIMA, L-I-M-A, right? I'm not even going to go through that acronym because I don't really care. It's just, it's, just, it's just like, why am I going to read something that just like reading Dick and Jane went up the hill to fetch a pail of water? That's what it is. It's like reading this children's coloring book. But one of the things that debunks B.F. Skinner is a quote from the U.S. National Library of Medicine National Institutes of Health. And the link is there. And then there's another link from psychologytoday.com where it says uh, in 2016, uh, the, the episode is, uh, the, the vlog is, or sorry, the blog is, or whatever the article, it says, where operant conditioning went wrong. So it's been decried. It's been, it's been debunked. But the industry, 
the dog trainers and behaviors that are still relying on that because that's all they know. They're driving their little, you know, <laughs> you know gas beater, uh, little, you know, three-cylinder car. And they're saying, oh, yeah, no, operant conditioning still works. Operant conditioning still works. It, it, this is what Lima is. This is, uh, uh, you know, positive training. This is all that stuff. And I'm not trying to devalue that. I'm just saying that the industry itself is doing a significant disservice to the trainers and behaviors by leading them down the wrong path. It's like taking the wrong directions on GPS and driving the wrong highway for two hours and then realizing, holy crud, I'm 200 miles away from my starting point and now I have to double back and drive 200 more miles to just catch up where I was before, which is impossible, yada, yada. It's, it's going down the wrong road. So this quote from the U.S. National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health, says in their article, and the link is there, it says, famed linguist Noam Chomsky, or am I, Noam, Noam, Noam Chomsky, debated Skinner's theory to which he says, Chomsky's review, uh, this is what the, um, uh, what you call, this is what the U.S. National Library of Medicine's article says, Chomsky's review is, uh, Chomsky's review is perhaps a single most influential paper published since Watson's Behaviorist Manifesto, which Chomsky's paper is considered to be a classic and is cited as final evidence of the inadequacies, the inadequacies of behaviorism as a general framework for animal behavior and human affairs. When I found that the other day, I was like, oh my gosh, I was right, <laughs> you know? But it's nice to see this happen with such a uh, well-known individual. And he went publicly after B.F. Skinner. Again, he says it cites as final evidence of the inadequacies of behaviorism as a general framework for animal behavior and human affairs. Kaboom. But then the industry still on it. So next time you hear someone saying operant conditioning, say, you know what? Chomsky said something else about that. And they're like, Chomsky, wow, Chomsky. Uh, and it goes on in, in the National uh, Library of Medicine uh, article there. It says, Chomsky's review of Skinner's major book is perhaps the most devastating review ever written. It sounded the death knell for behaviorism. And it's referenced to page 97 of, of his uh, review. Uh, and it goes on, probably thousands of students in cognitive psycholo psychology classes throughout the world have been confronted with Chomsky's review as conclusive evidence of the case against behaviorism. Uh, and, then, uh, and then here's an excerpt from, uh, I did a Google search on what behaviorism means, and the number one Google result came from a website called verywellmind.com forward slash behavioral psychology. And then the link is in, in the description. You can see it as well. And it says that defines behaviorism, also known as behavioral psychology, is a theory of learning based on the idea that all behaviors are acquired through conditioning, operant conditioning, lima, positive, blah, 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 right? Okay. Conditioning occurs through interaction with the environment. Behaviors believe that our responses to environmental stimuli shape our actions which is what B.F. Skinner did, which is what he's been debunked now, which is what operant conditioning has been debunked, which is what dog training industry lives and preys upon. And I mean prey as in P-R-A-Y-S because predatorial behavior shouldn't be in humans, shouldn't be in trainers and behaviors. This article was also written in 2006. So you're looking at 13 years since nothing has replaced that in the in the United States uh, National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health. In 13 years since it was published in 2006, there's been no ref refutation of it. It's not been refuted. It's not been challenged of Chomsky's statement that B.F. Skinner was wrong, that operant conditioning was wrong. I've been screaming about this and crying about it and talking about it and whining about it forever. And here it is, decades before me. So it's the higher functioning people that are realizing operant conditioning and reward-based behavior, uh, re reward, uh, rewarding behavior based on dysfunctions. It's silly. It's, it's the industry robbing you blind and taking your money and then saying you got to kill your dog. 
You go through the heartache of killing your dog. I would not want to be in a position where someone tells me, yeah, your dog is like that and there's no hope for your dog. And because I'm the best trainer in the world, you got to kill your dog. And I think to myself, oh my gosh, the best trainer in the world told me that my dog's this bad. I got to kill my dog because the best trainer in the world said it. How can you be the best trainer in the world if you're telling people to kill their dog? Worse, how can you be the best trainer in the world if you don't know how to explain the generality of fear of that dog instead of saying that dog can't be fixed? This is where I step in. This is where I say I have essentially the cure for cancer when it comes to behavioral behaviors of dogs, right? When it comes to dysfunctions of dogs, I have the cure and it's been 100% consistent across the board. And it's so simple. It's so super duper simple. And yes, I have a rare gift with dogs and I'm reading them at two tenths of a second. But when I'm meeting people with their dog, they are telling me their own intuitive observations of their dogs, which are pretty well bang on. They just didn't know what the answers were to it. So it an, I'm not doing anything special. Chomsky, he, he, ripped, he ripped Skinner apart. They even interviewed Chomsky years after his review of Skinner, and he said, I still stand by what I said before without any revisions. Well, I, oh, maybe a minor revision. I can't remember what he said. But he did say, I stand behind what I said the first time. So one of the things I wrote back in that post was keep in mind, in which I've just said this, keep in mind that the article is written 2006 and has not been refuted by the dog training industry across all accreditation facilities. Every single dog training university accreditation, APDT, blah, 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 Dr. Dunbar, yada, yada. None of this has ever been refuted by any of them. None of them have put a counter or even another thought perspective publicly presented that has refuted what is in the government's website, the national government, US, uh, US National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health, nonpartisan. Nothing's, nothing's refuted it. The industry has had a century Slavery, all that stuff. The, the, the industry has had a century to be able to 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 bring up something, and so uh, what I said then is this is why the industry is quietly transitioning to Lima as they try to distance themselves from operant conditioning. This is my theory, right? This is why they go to Lima so that they can distance themselves from operant conditioning. And I suspect, I strongly suspect that they will then, the industry, the dog training industry, the dog psychology, the academics and, and you know, Ledger and all these people, they will then start quietly, tacitly, overt, uh, covertly trans, uh, transitioning and shifting towards recognizing emotionally contextual behaviors of dogs, relational to their psychological dysfunctions. In other words, they're going to get away from treat training dogs because they know it's not working to realizing that it's an emotional, it's a psychological, it's a cognitive based issue. It's fear, it's psychological, it's definable. It's able to follow each root of that tendril from the tree trunk all the way down of that psychological dysfunction of your dog. That's what's gonna happen to this industry in a couple of generations when they finally catch up, when they finally put on the third wheel on their tricycle. Operant conditioning has been uh, is openly disputed. Okay, so we've got the Chomsky thing. Got the it's in the the National Medicine Library of the U.S. government. Uh, it's been debunked by his own Skinner's own peers. Operant conditioning is still going on, but unfortunately, a lot of people, especially in the profession, aren't willing to acknowledge that that treat training a, a dysfunctional dog is completely nonsensical and counterintuitive. Your dog is angry, you don't give your dog food. Your dog is angry and trying to attack another dog, you don't give your dog food. Your dog is angry and trying to attack other people, you don't give your dog food. Your dog is angry 
and turns on you because you're trying to get him to stop attacking other people or other dogs and they start attacking you. They start biting you. And those of you who have dysfunctional dogs like that have that happen. And I've had that happen to me. And when I, mine are Danes. And when my Danes or someone else's Dane turns on me and bites me because they don't understand feeling and touch because their owner never got them that way because they never knew about it. They bite me and it hurts like freaking crazy and they cause me to bleed. And I've shown some photos where I've had some significant bites and they bite across the entire thigh, the entire rib cage. They don't just like little chihuahua nips, love bites. They, they, and it's, it's deep impact wounds as well. That bruising doesn't service for, for years. But the last thing I'm ever going to do with any of these dogs is give them a treat when they're reacting. Cause I really know it's not going to help. And it doesn't matter who has accreditation and who has these certificates and learning all this stuff, the, the you know, the blind leading the blind. It doesn't matter. Take those certifications and the certificates and the, and the accolades and all that stuff and bring it with you the next time you see a dangerous dog and go, here, dog, here's some treats. Here's my certificates. Now you got to stop being angry. And then that dog, who's significant in size, 150 plus pounds, will look at you and wait for the opportunity to corner you and kill you. And it's not a joke. It's the ridiculousness of what the industry is going through because the ones at the top are not being clear and not admitting that what they're doing is wrong and that they're fumbling because of the pride. You look at all these, uh, the SPCA is hosting some sort of silly convention thing here this year, I think it was. Like, it's all this ridiculousness of these people patting each other on the back saying, yeah, we did great. And then not realizing that only 60% success rate. We are doing great. Who's the victim? Our dogs. Who's the second victim? The families. You guys. You guys are the victims. You know who's a really good trainer to go to? And I have that about what to look for in a trainer. Are the trainers that go, I, you know, I'm going to admit to you, I don't know what to do. Try somebody else. That's the trainer that you want to come back to have them teach you to do obedience. That's the trainer that you want that you, that has a doggy daycare or pet store. That's the trainer. That's the behaviors. That's the person that you want to patronize because they're humble and they're modest enough to say, I don't know what to do and I'm going to be honest with you. The last thing you want is the trainer behavior that says, your dog's the worst I've ever seen. Those worst dogs that I've never, that they've never seen before are median. They're M-E-D-I-A-N. These are the normal type of dogs that I deal with. Normal. Riley, right, uh, when, I, when I meet Riley, um, Tova, with you and your partner, I already told you, it's going to be straightforward. It's going to take a lot of mundane work and practice and practice and practice, but I already know what her issues are. I already told you on the, on the vlog yesterday, uh, on Wednesday, and I already told you I know what to do. If you see the video of, of Riley, she is just what you would say, bat crazy, right? Bat crap crazy. And she's on this leash and she's this cute little black dog, but she is really just all over the place and she's barking and, and the owner, right, have no control over her. And it's all over the place and just nonstop. And the dog is across the street. And I'm like, yeah, it's just, it's straightforward. There's no surprise. It's going to be easy. And every time people are taught, Feed your dog treats. Feed your dog treats. Your dog's angry. Feed your dog treats. Your dog's upset. Feed your dog treats. Okay? So the next time you're having an argument with somebody and they're angry at you, give them a treat. So I'm just going to close this off and just getting back to what Annette Miller asks about how do you help a dog control the emotions. The more excited, anxious, the more he continues to work himself into a yapping frenzy. Right? So our dogs are getting upset. And like I said in the beginning of my vlog, there's a dysfunction. It's an anxiety driven issue. It's the need to be acknowledged. It's the need to feel safe. And the general aspect of this question, because it's hard to be specific, because to be specific means to address the dog specifically and then going, that's why he's yappy. And that's why he's getting into a frenzy. That's why he's inconsolable. That's why, because of his dysfunction. We can't go out and describe somebody who has a bad temper 
without saying, well, the reason he's got a bad temper is because he's just had a bad life. Okay, you know, I've talked about this before. Why did he have a bad life? Oh, well, he was in foster care. Then we start getting down the root, the roots of that trunk, right? What we see, the iceberg, we get into the, into the below surface of what the dog's issues are. Psychological. We can't just brute force things. Dogs, dogs are smart enough to understand jealousy. They're smart enough to understand time. They can process pain in a redundant format. The way the dog blinks is indicative of processing. It's cognitive and emotional processing. It's the blending of it. Same with hackles raised in the front and the back of the dog, the full pillow erection, what, what one of my former clients called a uh, full mohawk. It's conscious and subconsciously rooted. And then they have this thing that they call tail set, S-E-T, tail set, the tail set up here, the tail set down. It's not a set, silly people. It's a behavior. It's a routine behavior. They're wagging the tail up. They're wagging it slowly. They're wagging it to the left side only or the right, right side only. They're wagging it on an angle. They're wagging it in a swish. They're wagging it slow, then quickly, then slow, then quickly. These are all based on the processing of the dog on an emotional context. Then it's logically driven after that. Subconscious and conscious behavior. Talk to Dr. Ledger. Why does a dog's tail wag? I don't know. We're not sure yet. I know. If I didn't know, I would be dead. I'm actually looking for another dog. I keep talking about this. I'm, I'm looking for another dog. It's got to be 150 plus pounds. Got to be at least 35, 36 inches at the withers, which means that their head would come up to about just below my chest, and I'm 5'11". That would be, that on, like on all fours, I would have to, and I, it's the dog that's attacked at least six to nine people. And it's got to be a Great Dane because I love Great Danes. They're my personal breed favorite. I will only adopt extremely dangerous dogs, and that will be a Great Dane. And save Rocky, the uh, largest Great Dane rescue in North America, knows I'm looking for one because I've talked to Amy, the founder. Uh, Elaine Dixon, the founder of New Hope for Danes, the oldest Great Dane rescue in Canada established in 1984. She's saved over 5,000 Great Danes and mixes. She knows I'm looking for that. Erica Cowley from One Dane at a Time knows. Stephanie Campbell. Uh, everyone knows. It's not an embellishment. It's not me trying to be brave. It's just that's where my skill set is. It's because I know that the most extremely dangerous dogs, the most extremely skittish dogs like Minky, they can all be downtrained. I've proven it without medication, without treats. People said to me, well, what do you think of the prognosis? What do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to be the next step? What do you think is going to, um, you know, how long do you think it's going to take? That's why I say like, you know, with Walter, it was 12 months to 19 months. I had to change it. I had to literally almost double it. And I kind of suspected that because I knew they weren't really telling me everything. The blindness thing was, was not cool for sure. That, that was not cool. That's, that, ex, that was really, a, that's a totally different thing to deal with on any dog. And that was tough. That was very, very tough. So we always want to address the dog on their emotional context, right? And we have to understand when they're, our dogs are yip, uh, na and yapping and frenzy and all that stuff. That's why I have an article, um, a vlog about how to stop dogs from jumping up on us. And I explained that it's an anxiety driven issue and it's a dependency driven issue. And people have tried it and it works for them when they're consistent, right? Michael Martin, right? Debbie, you've done it. It works. I uh, talk about dogs barking at the window, how to stop dogs barking from the window, get them to stop. And it's all really super easy. And you hear me when I'm talking to the dogs here, Lincoln or, or uh, whoever starts barking, like, stop yelling. And they're like, uh, and they do it and then they stop. Uh, yeah, dogs get hangry. They get, they get upset because they're the motivation, Christian, the motivation is a little bit different for them because now they have the feeling of pain, uh, right? That hunger pain but they can learn to control it because you can see dogs that aren't dysfunctional that are able to, you know, I've done it where I've forgotten to feed my dogs because I'm on online or I have overslept or whatever. And they don't get upset. They're not screaming. They're not attacking each other. They're a little bit more alert and a bit more predatorial, right? Cause it's a natural inclination for a dog that is hungry or for any animal. It's to start looking for stuff to eat, to kill, to eat. 
So that's where it's at. Anyhow, um, oops, no, oh, there we go. It was just flip that over by accident. Sorry, guys. All right. So um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. This is the end of my vlog, and I want to thank all these great questions. Unfortunately, I couldn't even see half of them because my silly machine computer is uh, goofy. But I do have new equipment, my video camera. I got it set up, so I'm going to figure out how to get that connected. It doesn't record directly onto my computer. So that means why I may not be doing live vlogs, but I will probably, probably publish the live the, the vlog as a premiere on my Facebook and YouTube, and then I will be live on it to answer comments while it's showing. And hopefully, it's going to have a different look. It's going to have a little bit more clean. It's going to give me a few a few episodes to get my uh, to to kind of practice a little bit right just like with dog training uh, practice a little bit and then once i get that established then then we'll start uh, then i'll start uh, it'll, it'll be a bit different but you know hopefully the sound quality has been better video quality is going to be way better after this because it, it it shoots in 1080 uh uh with uh with uh 60 frames per second i don't know what that means i'm too old for this technology even if i'm asian but uh, all i know is it's a really good picture um so aside from that, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. If you have questions, feel free to put them in the comments. If you uh, enjoyed my vlog, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at arf, arf, bark, bark. I am a registered nonprofit. I do have a couple of fundraisers. One is through GoFundMe, and the other one is through Patreon, which is in my description as well. And that goes towards helping other people with their dogs um, who don't have the financial ability to do so. So uh, still kind of um, trying to work at this uh, altruistic aspect of what we should be doing for dogs in general in our community. We're all dog lovers and we should be able to do this all together. Have an incredible Friday. Please be kind to other people. Please spend an extra 20, 30 seconds listening to somebody that you don't want to listen to telling you the same thing over and over again. And then after that, just say, hey, you know what? Can we not talk about this anymore? Let's move on. Tough love, right? Be firm and all that stuff. Have an enjoyable Friday. We will see you on Monday. And it's going to be a big surprise what's going to happen with the the. Vi I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to. I haven't figured out what room to do it in. Uh, but the cool thing is actually is Christina, since you're still here, Christina, is you may recognize some artwork that will be coming into the background in my podcast, vlog, whatever you want to call it. And that will be from Daydreamer Art Illustrations. And we know who she is. So um, it's going to be great. So I'm going to be featuring art from um, somebody who has an incredible intuitive uh, ability. Uh, she did portraits for some of my dogs. She did one for Nero um, before he passed away uh, at my request. Beautiful, absolutely gorgeous encapsulates uh you know the life and vibrancy of nero and those of you know <clears throat> those of you know who um yeah uh yeah shannon shannon has done amazing work um stacy uh did you happen to have a video from a picture i posted about trust did you happen to have a video from a picture I posted about trust? You know, Stacy, I don't know um, uh, which video you're talking about. So, um, you know, uh, join my closed uh, reactive dog group, right? Well, it's not closed because I'm anyone can join it. Uh, join my reactive dog group. Um, it's been repurposed, so I've now I've got like just two thousand members in there right now. But again, you, know, you have a question, you throw it on there on my group, you post it up there with clear photos of your dog's eyes, face, and body, and then I'll go over it in my live vlog or in my podcast. Um, and I am working towards making different tweaks. So in the next couple of months, you're going to see certain shifts and changes, and you can see me moving more towards a branding aspect of what I'm doing. Um, at the uh, uh, with the support of uh, some some uh, a, a, a talented a very talented um, social media uh, individual um, who has been uh, out here helping me same with um, you know so uh, I, I'm really happy and I also want to say thank you to uh, as well is to uh, and it's probably reverse so you can't see it but Alan Shelton uh, who is uh, Awakening Leadership Beyond Self-Mastery. He used to be uh, a VP for Amazon, 
and he has uh, worked for uh, PwC Price Waterhouse Cooper. Uh, Cooper, I think it is, uh, right at the top there, helping with significant mergers and acquisitions and all that. Uh, him and his wife, Justine, are um, also helping me, um, providing support every once in a while and, and moving forward. So um, uh, I'm going to work towards making this into a brand. And those of you who have been following me from day one, and I mean, you know, I'm going to be the same person I always have been. So it's not like there's anything going to be great because my goal is to help save lives. Thank you, everybody. Have fun and uh, be kind. And, uh, you know, there's always somebody out there who can help you. Bye-bye.